Okay, so I want to do a quick video discussing what do we do in problems logic when we have unknown aspects to our expressions. So everything we've done so far has had a very clear and definitive way of how we get to a truth value, whether that be through logical operations or conditional based operations, just stuff like that. So there's never been anything that was just outlandishly, we don't know the answer to this. And that's what we're going to discuss in this video. So let's go ahead and hop on over there. All right. So if you look here, we have the idea of predicates and quantifiers. So it's going to be two different things we're going over. First one, starting with predicates. So we'll do those in just one second. But what we're used to in traditional mathematics and algebra is having some variables in our expression. So here we have x is an odd number, and then we have y is greater than z. Right. So we don't know what x, y, and z is, or what they are but we can figure that out with enough information or we can just plug in some random value to determine if these statements are true or false. Now, if you look at truth table, the statement can be expressed as function p of the variable x as in p of x, which should be a very commonly understood aspect of what the parentheses around x is. It's just this function of this value. So here, we have p of x is a finally statement x is an odd number so what we want to do is just plug in a value so we do p of 5 of course on as a statement 5 is an odd number and we can actually do some of this but what we've done is we've taken what is known as a predicate and transformed it into a proposition which is what we're more familiar with so what do i mean by predicate so any logical statement whose truth value is a function of one or more variables is known as a predicate. And what that really means is that if we have a statement and we want to apply a truth value to it, but we don't know all the information, as in we have a variable like this x here, well, we can't determine if it's true or false. So it has some unknown variable to it, therefore it is a predicate. Meanwhile, if we plug in the five, like p of five here, there's no longer an unknown aspect. So this five is an odd number, it's just a proposition. So as long as we can account for all the unknown values in a predicate, it therefore becomes a proposition as we can determine if it's true or false. So in this case, five is an odd number, that's true. So that's predicates. So doing some quick value substitution. Let's see, q of x, y with x squared equals y and then r of x, y, z for x plus y equals z. So here we're gonna plug in five and 25 for q. So we have five squared equals 25, that is true. And then we have r of two, three, six, two plus three is not equal to six, therefore this is false. So this is basic value substitution. We have some unknown statements here of x squared equals y, don't know what x is, don't know what y is, x plus y equals z, don't know what any of those are. So just plug in some values like this five and 25, that's two, three, and six, and you're good to go. Now, that's only accounting for one instance of what these can be. So we need to figure out what they can all could possibly be. And to do that, we have what's known as a domain. So domain of a variable in a predicate is a set of all possible values that the variable can be. So typically we specify these at the very beginning of the problem, but they have a very, very strong impact over the entire expression because they dictate what the variables can and what they cannot be. So in this case, we have a few examples of all real numbers, only even numbers, only positive integers, and there's really no limit to what these can be. They don't have to be numbers. It can just be whatever you want them to possibly be. There, there is no limit. However, in this course, most things are gonna be in the realm of numbers, usually positive integers, and more specifically of what we will and what we don't have is we're all gonna be dealing with real numbers. You can do imaginary numbers in domain. We're not doing any imaginary numbers in the scope of this course. So just keep that in mind. Now, a little more value substitution with a restriction on our domain. So domain here, right there, is gonna be all positive integers. So we have P of X, X is a prime number, L of x, y, x is less than y, s of x, y, z, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. So we have p of seven, true or false. Um, let's see, seven is a prime number. That's true. We have uh, 
x is less than y. So that means 6 is less than 6. That's false because it's saying strictly less than. It's not less than or equal to. So yeah, that's false. And then we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared for 3, 4, and 5. So that would be 3 squared is 9. 4 squared is 16. 5 squared is 25. 9 plus 16 is equal to 25. So we true. So we should end up with true, false, true. And we do. So that's not too bad. Again, this is just specifying what we can, what we can't have. So we can't plug in any negative values here or zero. And they all have to be integers, so no floating point. And then we just did some basic value substitution. So the domain didn't really do a whole lot here. So when does it come into play? Well, it comes into play when we want to do quantifiers. So if a predicate has all unknown variables accounted for, it becomes a proposition since the unknown element no longer exists. Everything we've done so far has been direct value substitution, so it only dictates the true or false value for the specific instance that we plug values into. And like I said, that's not really extremely helpful unless we have just one specific question. But what we can do is use what's called a quantifier. We're going to go over two of those, universal and existential. We can use those to account for every single value in the domain. But it is going to alter what question we're asking specifically. More on that in a bit. But let's go ahead and start with the universal quantifier. So the logical statement of this upside down a of x, p of x, reads as for all x, p of x, or for every x, p of x. So here's a little quantifier here is an upside down a, and if we have that in an actual statement, then it is now a universally quantified statement. So universal x, p of x, asserts that p of x is true for every possible value for x in its domain. So if we were to do a domain of all positive integers, the statement that we are saying needs to be true for every single positive integer possible. And that is an infinite amount, but it is possible to do it. Now, universal x p of x is true if and only if, sorry, p of n is true for every n in the domain of variable x. So what we can actually kind of break this down as is this universal x p of x is the same as p of a1, conjoined with p of a2, conjoined with p of a3, so on and so forth, until eventually get to the last value, if there is a last value. But what's happening is this is true, conjoined with true, conjoined with true, so on and so forth, conjoined with true. And then maybe after a trillion trues, we get a single false. Well, that's false. Do the same thing if we do one times one times one times one, so on and so forth, times zero. We have a trillion ones here, one times one times one times one, and eventually we hit one times zero. Well, since it's multiplication, the entire thing is zero, just like the entire thing is false here. So, proving a universal statement, a universally quantified statement, true, is much more difficult than proving it false because we need a near infinite amount uh, true values as opposed to a single false value. So it's very easy to disprove a universal quantifier and we can do that with counterexamples. So an element with a domain for which a predicate is false. So let's see which of these are false. We have the domain of all positive integers. We have universal x, x squared is greater than zero. So that means that every single positive integer that we plug in here should be true. So let's see. Mm, the lowest value we have is 1. So 1 squared is greater than 0. Well, that's true. Let's see, here we have x minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Same thing, 1. 1 minus 1 is greater than or equal to 0 because we have the equal. True, and then x minus 1 is strictly greater than 0. Well, 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 is not greater than 0, so this one is false. Therefore, 1 is our counterexample. True, true, false. And just like that. Moving on, we have existential quantifier. So the logical statement of this uh, backwards e sign of x, p of x, reads as there exists an x, so it's that p of x. So backwards e is the existential quantifier. Existential x, p of x is called ex existentially quantified statement. That needs to say an, but it's okay. So 
exponential x, p of x, asserts that p of x is true for at least one possible value for x in its domain. So as opposed to universal statement, where we need every single input to be true, the existential statement just needs a single input to be true. And you can tell this because since e of x, p of x is true if and only if p of n is true for at least one value n, we can break that down just like saying p of a1 disjoint p of a2 disjoint p of a3 so on and so forth which is going to be true disjoint with true this isn't changing anything but let's uh let's take a different look at it what if we did false disjoint with false just one with false just one with false so on and so forth well this is going to be false because nothing is true but then the moment we do this well the entire thing is true because this is the same as saying 0 plus 0 plus 0 0 plus 1 which is 1 so this is basically how external quantifier works we just need a single value so it's much easier to prove existential quantifiers true than it's proven false so they're kind of the exact opposite of a universal quantifier now when it comes to proving these near infinite or well some are infinite some are probably infinite but when it comes to proving these outlandishly large domains true or false we use what is called an arbitrary element and that just means that nothing is assumed with element other than the fact that it exists inside the domain so let's say you wanted to prove a universal quantifier true well you would find some value or some formula that is always true. So if my domain was all positive integers, I would say x is, say, greater than zero. And I would use this as my arbitrary element, or something akin to this as my arbitrary element, and plug that into the value. And then, well, that statement's always true. So if I use that to try and prove the universal quantifier, and that ends up being true, then the overall thing is true. And it's a lot easier said than done, but I won't get too much into the semantics right now. Now, for our quantified statements, they can also be constructed using logical operations, just like basic propositional statements. So here we have a domain, all positive integers. We have two predicates, p of x, x is prime, o of x, x is odd. Okay. So let's say this, we have existential x, p of x, conjoined when the gated o of x, and we have universal x, p of x, implies o of x. So how do these read? Well, let's start with the existential one. So existential x, p of x, conjoined with gated o of x, states that, well, existential x, there exists a positive number, p of x, that is prime, conjunction and, a gate o of x not odd so this whole expression here reads as there exists a positive number that is prime and not odd well this is going to be true because we only need one single value and if we use x equals 2 2 is both prime and not odd therefore this is a true statement here meanwhile down here we have a universal quantifier so we need everything to be true nothing can be false so we have universal x for every positive integer x p of x, if x is prime, conditional, then o of x, x is odd. So universal x, p of x implies o of x reads as for every positive integer x, if x is prime, then x is odd. Well, this one's gonna be false because again, if we use x equals two, x is a prime number that is not odd. So there's one instance where this statement is false, therefore universally it is false. Meanwhile, it's essentially this one is true. So reading them out is a little bit cumbersome. You have to actually understand what the predicate is and then understand all the logical operations and what it's specifically saying, but it's not too bad once you actually understand what is happening. Now, what differentiates propositions and predicates is the idea of free and bound variables. So variables are classified as free or bound according to their relationship to quantifiers. So regarding p of x, x is a free variable since it is free to be any element within the domain. 
doesn't matter um, at all what it is. It's just you can set it. However, with universal XP of X, or it could be existential P XP of X, it is bound since it is bound to the universal quantifier here. So now it must actually act in accordance with the universal quantifier to attempt to try and prove everything true. The moment it becomes false, we get a false value, but that actually binds the X so you can determine is this true universally or is it false universally? Because the statements defer if it's universal or existential, but we can still derive some actual meaning from it on whether it is true or false. Whereas with P of X, we don't know. We, we just don't know. We don't have enough information. So that kind of is what the differentiator there is. Now, the Morgan's Law, because it's just always there. So it works with quantifiers, very similar to how it works with traditional statements. If we have the domain of all birds, like I said, doesn't have to be numbers, then we have a predicate, f of x, x can fly. So if we say not every bird can fly, that's the same as saying there exists a bird that cannot fly. So let's see, not every bird can fly, I can list uh, penguins, ostriches, emus, cassowaries, kiwis. None of these can fly. Therefore, that is true that not every bird can fly. We have at least one instance where it cannot fly. So yeah. And then there exists a bird that cannot fly. Again, the same examples. So there exists at least one that cannot fly. And then we can translate these English statements to logical statements by saying not every bird, that's the universal x negated, can fly. That is our predicate. So negated universal x f of x, logical equivalent to by De Morgan's law, we are going to swap our negation to the actual from the quantifier to the actual predicate and then change what the quantifier is. So in this case we have negated universal x becomes non-negated existential x but then our regular f of x the predicate is now negated. So there exists at least one bird that cannot fly. But if we have negated uh, existential x P of X, and we apply to Morgan's Law, we end up with universal X not P of X. So, yeah, not too bad. So, overall, that is the idea of predicates and quantifiers, and it kind of summarizes as what we do whenever we don't have all the information for our statements because we can't derive a true or false value if we have unknown aspects to it. But, we can alter the question we're really asking and saying, hey, do we care if this is true all the time or are we just asking is this true at least once? And the moment we do that, we can actually quantify some genuine true or false value to the statement. So it's not exactly the same question, but it's asking a question in enough detail to derive some answer if we have a domain. So using domain and using a universal or accident quantifier we can solve a predicate and transform that into a proposition, thus giving us an actual dignified true or false result. So that's all for these. Hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next video.